Where do you want to go, bright teeth? <laughs> I appreciate you. Uh, I like my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong? <clears throat> Dave Hibben. <sighs> Where are you from? Where Am were I you supposed born? to answer you? Yeah. Well, if you feel like it. If you want to answer me. Uh, I was adopted. I'm not sure. Get out of town. Is that true? That's very true. Man, where did you grow up? I grew up in upstate New York and then uh, North or Maryland, then North Carolina. How about that? So upstate New York, is that like a Buffalo kind of thing or uh, Albany? Like or? a Syracuse kind of thing. Syracuse. Yep. Cortland. Yeah. Where the Salisbury factory used to be back in the day, Brockway. Old Brockway trucks. Yeah. You were adopted. What age do you know? Right out of the gate? Uh, I don't know. It was about like that. Yeah. Knee high to a duck. He was uh, adopted. Knee high to something. Yeah. I, uh, I was a foster parent for a little while. I tried to adopt one. Uh, the little fellow's name was Rocky. Uh, Did you adopt me? I would have adopted you. Yep. <laughs> I, uh, luckily, at some point in my life, uh, you adopted me for a little short yeah, period of time. A so. very short period of time. Yeah. I think if I'd have been in those shoes, I would have adopted you until you came of age where you could talk, and then I would have had to. Yeah, kind of shoo you away. <laughs> yeah. 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 If you're willing, <laughs> I'd love to hear your career. You retired. So many of us on the truck, I know that's a sensitive term around you, uh, <laughs> but so many of us look at our career and we look down the road at, at a retirement at some age. I'm going to be honest with you, it's a myth. Like to me, retirement is far enough away that it just seems like this thing that we're supposed to plan for, but it's never coming. Uh, years are going by, and I know it's coming, but it, in my planning and in my uh, general day to day, it feels like it's so far away. Yeah, it takes some time, but I mean, I mean, it's so fast. I mean, five years turns into ten years, turns into twenty years. Yeah, and then. Uh, the worst part about it is is probably your last two or three years. And anybody that sets one of them retirement calculators in their phone ends up turning it off because they get frustrated. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think that the way to get over that is go to the busiest company you can go to for your last few years. Because, number one, it will give you a sense of accomplishment. And, number two, it makes that time fly by. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've seen and witnessed the opposite. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna agree there. It seems like <clears throat> in our little department, it seems to be the opposite. The when the older guys get closer to that time, they want to go to a slower house. Well, it's if they're very, broken, that makes sense. Yeah, it's it's an interesting perspective to hear from, from you coming. You know, from the other side of that, just go to the busiest house you can. Exactly right. It's interesting. Yeah, what <clears throat> what did your career look like? Like as far as when did you start thinking, I'm, I'm looking at retirement? When did that come into your picture? Uh, had a lot to do with my personal life. Sure. I mean, divorce sucks, and then you plan for it, and you work through it, and yeah. you stay as long as you have to have to make it happen. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of how that played out. So, I, yeah, that had nothing to do with my whole career path. That was my personal path. Yeah, I think a lot more Edit. people uh, are familiar with that. Yeah, you know? well, a lot of firemen are familiar with that. I mean, it's a tough job. You work shift work. It is what it is. I mean, you're home and you're not. And you, everybody knows, you know, you can pick up 12 hours here or there, you're going to go. I mean, for years, you'd be home for Christmas morning, open presents with your kids, and you know you were working overtime that night. But by then, who cares? Everybody else was, you know, food coma. Yeah, go, go make twelve hours. Yeah, right. And that that you know that that tears part of relationship. So it's it's no secret to any of us. That's right. This industry it's tough on the relationship. Yeah. Do you it think is. it's something in our something in our biological nature when we get into being a fireman that it's always mission first? I don't we're, know about biological anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's, no. it's it's just something in us though that it, we always we just we want to be at the firehouse. I, I mean, I want to be there. It's not a, I have to be there to support my family. I mean, I want to be there. Yeah. I, I want to go to work. I want to do my job. So at this point in my career, personally, it's, it's, it's the fire truck people 
You know, they, they, they run hand in hand with my yeah, home look, family. That's not bullshit, but you want to go to fire. That's right. That's You're all. exactly and right. That, that's what's driven. Yeah. So you, what you, is it, what is it like about somebody like you, like Steve, what, what is, what is that? What, where does it come from? I don't have any idea, but going to fires are fun. Yeah. I don't know anything else. I don't even know how to answer a question like that. <laughs> yeah. But going to fires are fun. Sure. Yep. Sure is. You're, um, uh, when did you start thinking that, uh, what kind of time out? So in other words, I'm 10 years in and retirement seems so far away, you know, 10 years is no time. I, I don't say that like it's a big length, but you know, I'm a third of the way through and it seems like so far away. Was it was at five years out or, or when you think about the end. Yeah. When you think about that retirement yeah, coming you around, you don't think about the end until you have 20, 25 years on. Yeah. I mean, it all depends on your system you're coming from, but. I didn't even really think about retirement until I had 25. Yeah. And then it was just numbers after that. So I have no regrets. Yeah. My, You're, uh, I have a couple, but not uh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a small list I keep in my pocket of those. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, uh, Engine 10, yep. is that where you retired from? I did. How long were you on that one? Which time? This last time. Uh, the last time. Uh you want me to get into politics with our old fire chief up there? I think that's an amazing idea. Mm. We had a guy named Kenny Ellerby, who ironically, he and I were assigned to, assigned to the same house back in the day. Um, we were both appointed. I was actually appointed to a truck company. You'll be proud to know. From that the, makes me feel from so From your good. world. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it was a uh, Engine 25 and Truck 8, which back in the late 70s, early 80s, was the busiest firehouse in the district. Um, and we were both assigned there. I actually worked with him. We rode the back step together. So years and years went by, and uh, he ended up being fire chief. And uh, I think he thought it, he was fucking with me when he sent me back to 10 Engine. Yeah. But he couldn't have done me a bigger favor in my life. Right. So I went back there and spent the last few years there. And uh, I was assigned there uh, when I first made lieutenant in 95. I went there on the truck. Um, I did my rounds. When you work in a busy place, you get put in time out every once in a while. So they send you here, they send you there, depending on who's in charge with all the politics. But it all ends up, you all end up getting back eventually. Yeah. So it was uh, real important to me to go back there and, and uh, that's where I wanted to stay. My wife tells me all the time, I said, why didn't you go somewhere? Because at the time, I was commuting from North Carolina. I mean, I was driving from North Carolina to D.C. for my shift. That's a drive. It was about six hours, depending on traffic. But uh, well, I did my last seven, eight years living in North Carolina. And she was like, why do you, why do you stay there? I said, you, you wouldn't even understand. Yeah. Uh, it's the people... I mean, you know, the guys from other jobs, they all look at us and don't understand. But people in that place are, as far as I'm concerned, I've been around a little while, uh, some of the best firemen I've ever worked in my life. Um, that, that place is, you know, when you do 30, 35, 40, or more runs a day, actually, back in the 90s, uh, a fellow named Greg Thompson was my wagon driver and he'll, he'll verify this. To this day, I think the record still stands. We ran 52 and 24 Whew. with three first two. Whew. Son of a bitch. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, and I believe that still stands. That's a good run. Oh, it was great. Yeah. I didn't go in service until we were back in the door, and there you go again. Yeah. It was just wow. one of the days. Yeah. So, Dave Hibben. Jeremy King. <coughs> hey, man. How you doing, sir? Nice to meet you. Yeah. Did you enjoy your day in the shit box? Oh, it was not great. You <laughs> <laughs> said it was not great. <laughs> uh, actually, it wasn't as bad as this weekend, but it was all right. Mm -hmm. Glad you're here. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Glad to have you. Yeah. That, how many guys were in your firehouse uh, at 10? You mean per shift? Yeah, like how many on each rig? Like, like we're used to this uh, three men on a truck. <laughs> What, three guys sleeping? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so back in the day, uh, it was six man trucks, five man engines, 
uh, five in the heavy rescue, uh, battalion aide and a battalion chief, two. Uh, we went through some tough times in D.C., uh, early 90s. Uh, they cut our staff in a little bit. We went back to four on a truck for a little while, um, uh, four on an engine. And that's when the whole control board and my boy Marion Barry was the mayor. Yeah. But he was in the news a lot, but he loved the fire department. Nothing. D.C. didn't have a pot to piss in, but he loved the fire department. And that's because the guys like uh, Dave Ryan and Tom Tippett, who were our union president at the time, used to go out to breakfast with the man every week. And we were golden. So anyway, back to staffing. Um, when I came on, we were six and five. Six on the truck, five on the engine. And uh, we went back to four and four for a while. Uh, we went back to five on the trucks for a while. And that's where they still are now. Uh, they're back to, well, they're on four on an engine now. So that's that's where it is today, unless something's changed that I don't know about. But it's sure. five and four, and five on a rescue. So, and when I say rescue, it's a heavy rescue, not not a shit box. Yeah. So. Gotcha. Uh, so like a, uh, a first do in your area, if it was just a, a room or two in the contents, uh, would that get handled just right in-house? Oh, no. I mean, it all depends on communications. And you know, D.C. used to handle all their own communications with the fire department. I mean, there was firemen that worked up there on light duty. There was guys that got it. Um, if anybody follows, like, Statter 911 or any of those other sure. websites, uh, when they made it an independent thing, MPD used to take care of their own dispatch. The fire department used to take care of their own. two different entities. They decided it was a great idea to make it all one, and it's been a train wreck ever since. Um, so to your question, like if, if they, they said smoke or whatever, it was, it was a box alarm. Mm -hmm. And in our world, a box was five engines, two trucks, a heavy rescue, two battalion chiefs and a couple of shit boxes. So there was a bunch of people there yeah. real quick. Um, I mean, back in the day in the eighties, um, especially in the third battalion where I was on the other side of the river. A double local was every day. What, what we didn't address is back in the day, there was two-piece engine companies, wagon, pumper. Every engine company had a wagon and a pumper. Four guys rode the wagon, and there was a pumper driver. So anywhere the wagon laid out from, the pumper picked it up. That went away in the early 90s, too, to single-piece engine companies. So back in the day, again, a double local was two engines, a truck, and a chief. And if it was a couple rooms in a hallway, like you mentioned, I mean, so what? Just handle it. Just handle it. I mean, if there was people trapped, they'd put the box on it with the rescue and blah, blah, blah. But 90% of the time, it was, you know, three or four rooms, you know, two engines in a truck. Yeah. That's just the way it was. And that was the first part of your career was Absolutely. Like how yep. that run. Yep. And that's, it sounds like a beautiful thing. It was very cool. Yeah. It was very cool. Uh, how many years of your career was a uh, truck company? Oh. Well, I was appointed to a truck. Then I went to the rescue. Then I got promoted. I don't know. You're going to have to edit some of this stuff out. I got to think now. That's kind of off. That's all right. <laughs> so yeah. it makes me feel a little bit better to know that. Uh, uh, you were on a truck at least a little tiny bit. I just want to know of at least three or four days, and then I'll feel better. <laughs> <laughs> you got to understand, too, though, when we got promoted sergeant, I mean, we had sergeants there, so sergeants are like, if a lieutenant or a captain took in, a sergeant used to live out of the trunk of his car. Wherever somebody was off that day, that's where you worked that day. That's yeah. just the way it was. <clears throat> So technically, as a sergeant, you were assigned to a truck because the truck companies had either a, a captain, three lieutenants, because we were 2472. We didn't always, but that's the way it was. Right. And uh, there was a sergeant. So that sergeant, even though he was assigned to a truck, he could be anywhere in the city for, for his next tour. Kind of like a floating position. Exactly. And uh, then if somebody like me or, you know, one of the other – old time guys decided to work overtime that night, I'd bounce that sergeant out and kick him somewhere else with nuts twelve hours. But yeah. that's just the way it was. I mean that's <laughs> right. just rule of the road. So yeah, I was assigned to a truck as a sergeant. 
um, when I made lieutenant in 95, I was assigned a 27 engine, which is on the, in Deanwood, on the east side of the Anacostia River. And then a guy named Billy Fitzgerald was captain of 10 engine at the time, um, was looking for a lieutenant to come to the truck, truck 13, the same house. So yeah, I went from 27 to truck 13, worked there for a little while. And uh, back in that time frame, uh, D.C. was going through a tough period with truck companies. I mean, there were 17 of them, and at some point, I think we were down to five because wow. they were all out of service broke, no money to fix them. Yeah. Wow. So uh, I, during that time, I was assigned to Truck 13 as a lieutenant, but I was detailed out. And then Billy was an up-and-coming rock star. He already was, but he was even more up-and-coming at the time. So he was acting chief all the time. So I would stay in the house and slide across the floor and, and work at 10. And um, we had some uh, in the 90s. That was that was great. And uh, then I got put in time out for a story we're not going to talk about. Okay, fair enough. And uh, <laughs> uh, I don't even remember where they sent me then. And uh, then I got in a motorcycle accident pretty bad. Uh, not too long after that, <coughs> I was off for, I was still assigned to 10, truck 13. And uh, I was off for over a year. And the members and officers of that house worked every one of my shifts for that entire year. I never used an hour's worth of sick leave. Wow. Until the bosses found out about it. And then they got pissed and put me in timeout again. So Yeah, that's remarkable. Yep. And... Uh, Guy named Wayne Branch was a captain of ten when I was on the truck, and we worked together on the same shift, and we got to be all right. And uh, he moved up in the food chain pretty good. And after I got put out in time out again uh, after the accident, he called me up one day and uh, asked me if I wanted to come to his shift and straighten out another problem in another part of the city. So I did that for a little while, and uh, you'll be happy to hear this. Again, uh, I got called, and I ended up going to Truck 4, which is a six-engine in Shaw. Another great house, fantastic house. Uh, some really good guys. I went to Truck 4 for a little while, and uh, I could have gone back to 10 at that point, but I didn't want to bounce anybody. I was senior, but you don't want to bounce anybody out of the job. I sure. Mean, you wait your turn. Yeah. And then when the opportunity came, Thanks to Ellerby, who thought he was fucking me, sent me back to ten. That's that's where I finished. Yeah. So total years at ten and <clears throat> ten in truck thirteen, uh, probably about half my career. Yeah, solid so, run. Yep. Yeah. So great house. Don't I don't want to take anything away from Saul either. Six and truck four, those were some rock solid dudes too. And everywhere else I worked too. I mean. You know, as you get senior on the job and you, and you know the guys and you know the, the mojo and you know what to expect, as a boss, you, you you know, when you don't have to say anything to anybody and everybody knows, that's what it's all about. That's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Did you work for any other departments other than D.C.? Nope. How about that? Uh, I got hired there when I was 20 years old. Wow. What did the academy look like? <laughs> so you ever hear the expression... When you tell a cop, if you scored five points higher, you could have been down the hill. Yeah. That's the way it was in D.C. Yeah. So we had a really small class. I don't think our class was 14, 15 guys. I mean, that was. Yeah. You know, a lot of people take that test. There's thousands of guys that take that job or that test for that job, and they don't hire, but you know, very small groups. So it's a tough job to get on only because the retirement's so good. Yeah. And the colas after you retire and, you know. It's, it's just pretty solid. Yeah. It's How long was the academy? In my time, 45 days. Now, months. Yeah. So, yeah. You had, and we used to have what we called 10-day wonders. You, get, you go to the academy for 10 days, get thrown out into the company because they were so short. And then you have to come back to the academy. And that, huh. that sucked. But yeah. Sucked for the guy doing it and sucked for the crew getting them, I'm sure. Well, I don't really care about them, but it sucked for the guy 
you know, having to go back to the academy after he's been to fires every day. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, back then we were working three, three, and three. Three, three short days, three long nights, three days off. That was, that was the schedule. And then in 86 or 7, I guess it was, we went to 24, 48 with a Kelly day every seventh day. And the, with the 26 weeks, you get a back-to-back Kelly twice a year. Mm-hmm. But everybody always worked their Kellys for overtime. So, And then in 92... We went to straight up twenty four seventy twos, and that's where they still are today. That three 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 was it a nine? Like the short day was a nine, or no? It was seven. Seven was a relief, but everybody got to work earlier than that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, like a set nine hours was your short shift? No, it was ten and fourteen. Ten and fourteen. Yeah, ten and fourteen. It's like seven to five and five to seven. But I mean, if you were working night work, you got to work at two thirty three o'clock at the latest. After you were painting or roofing or whatever you were doing, right? So, yeah, those relationships aren't going to destroy themselves. Mm-mm. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, pretty solid. Let me ask you about uh, some live burn stuff, if you don't mind. <coughs> um, okay. Before we met, how long had you been doing the live burn teaching? Uh, probably 2007. Down here, you mean in North yes. Carolina? Mm-hmm. Yeah, about 2007. Yeah. Uh, me and Hogue. Yeah. It, you started off with him? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it started in Oak Island. I think the first one I did uh, under Stephanie over at uh, Southeastern Community College. Uh, we built this, well, we burnt this strip mall with a bank involved in Oak Island. And it was a total shit show. Because at the time, Oak Island was not where Oak Island is today. And uh, it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. It sounds like it would be a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. How yeah. did um how did you and Ken come about? Um, where did y'all's relationship start? Church. Okay, I'm yep. so proud of you for that. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. And back in the day, we went to Unity Presbyterian in Denver, North Carolina, and uh, that's where we met, and uh, we've been best friends for a really long time now. Right. So. Yeah. Was yep. he burning, uh, doing live burn training before that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He was burning all of, you know, Hogue. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was a captain at five in Charlotte for eons. Yeah. And, uh, you know, back when five was doing the, doing everything every day. So, yeah, he, uh, that's, but I didn't know him from Adam until we met at church. And that's only because our wives were friends. Yeah. So that's how that all started. This so how, how long had you, had you been in D.C. when you and Ken when y'all's paths crossed, uh, you do the math. I yep. got hired in '85, and this is 2007. So okay, so y'all met in 2007. Yep, got it. Okay, yep. perfect. I'm with you. So yeah. how were both I... well into your careers? I was, I was really yeah. well into yeah, mine that's, by then. That's very interesting. Years, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very interesting. Yep. yep. Cool. So that's that's how me and Hogo hooked up. Nice. Uh, other than At it being church, fun, that's kind yeah. of funny. <laughs> I know. I, I love that part of it. Yeah, I'm sure you do. There is a soft side to me. So, hey, uh, little Edit. known fact: uh, I ran the music in church for ten years. Yeah, how'd that go? It went great. I, I learned uh, how to help the girl with the mic, and uh, I ran the music. I did. I did the whole deal. I'm just thinking muscle milk. I mean, the... I was much smaller back then. Yeah, just saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell everybody that story? Uh, the church story? No, the muscle milk story. Oh, yeah. Uh, of how that name got hung up That's on right. Me. Yeah. Uh, Which, Ken- by the way, we've been calling him muscle milk for years now, every time he shows up. Yeah. I've actually I called him that tonight when I saw him. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ken Hogue laid that one upon me in an uh, ag rescue class. Uh, that's been a while back. It was. Uh, I came in, had my muscle milk with me. Uh, mm-hmm. I was real into fitness, you know. I was trying to get them gains, and uh, I didn't want to miss a day. So, uh, yeah, I had worked out, got my muscle milk, and showed up for class. And uh, uh, in his addressing me, he saw that, and he was like, no. Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's Hogue. That's Hogue. That's Hogue. Yep. Man, that was uh, the day after that line of duty death in uh, just outside of Charlotte. Um what was that department? It, was it the uh, the strip mall? That's right. At the sports 
the sports store. Yeah, it was a golf. Oh, uh, that was uh, Pineville. Pineville, that's right. Yep, that was Pineville. Uh, Sheltra is the one that passed that day. And actually, Hogue was acting in the battalion position that day. He was on that call. Yeah. Yeah. It was at that golf store. It was. Yeah, but yep. Shelter was the kid's name. And I remember that only, and the reason I remember that, not to take anything away from it, but uh, I had a guy in my back step named Shelter. So that always resonated with me. Sure. So, yep. Yeah, that class, uh, after we all did the introductions, uh, he took a few minutes and, and told us about the scene and, and how things went down. Uh, yep. Yeah. What a scene. It's, yeah, it's crazy. It's, Big box store. Uh, doesn't happen every day. Yep. If you're not ready, I mean, bad things happen. So bad things happen. Unfortunately, that's yeah. the reality of it. So, but I remember that. I remember that fire. Yeah. Yeah. So that was uh that was when I met uh, Ken Hogue. That's when you met Hogue. Yeah. Okay. Yep. There you go. And uh, and got my name on the first day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that live burn. Uh, I'm sure that you got into it because it was fun. Uh, in in teaching. And, and doing the live burn setting, uh, did you find that it it ended up teaching you some stuff, or had you already learned everything by then? Nobody ever learns anything by yeah. then. No. Yeah. I'm so you, glad you, you learn every time you. <laughs> I do. I, mean, come I certainly on now. do. Yeah. I mean, you've been around enough of these live burns now. I mean, your students can go from, you know, rock stars to kids that have never done this before. Yeah. So you got to adjust, you got to adapt, you got to overcome a little bit. You mentioned earlier dinner that we weren't really going to talk about this, but let's talk about that one burn we did that time. We're not going to say where. Yeah. You know, but I mean, that was, that was scary. Yeah. I mean, some of them kids we were bringing in that place. That was, that was, we had to be careful. Yeah. And you know, you were there. Yeah. And uh, that's what the live burning training is all about. I mean, you, you take the ones that are 20 years old and never been in a burn building in their life to the guys that are, you know, 40, 45 that are still getting it. They want to learn, so yeah. you got to you got to adapt and overcome. I mean, the kids that end up throwing up in their masks. Oh, yeah. the special dinner, yeah, yeah the, the special, special dinner. dinner. Yeah, yeah, we're not yeah. Gonna, we're not going to go there, but yeah, the Man. special dinner one. Yeah, yeah that was when I met you. That's right. That special dinner uh, house. <laughs> uh, I learned something on that place. I we talked about it a little bit earlier. Uh, you didn't know how much of an impact it made on me, but yeah. uh, uh, there was a crew at the front. Um, I'll tell the story. Uh, it was a group of four, and like we talked about, the experience level is, is different. You know, you got mm -hmm. some that are uh, itching, can't wait to go inside, and some that are not, you know, and they were strongly encouraged to be there by the chief, and, you know, it's a training day, and they're not looking forward to it. Pudding pops. Yeah. So these these guys, uh, they were hemming and hawing, and they didn't want to go inside, and it was time. And, uh, and you came up, and uh, I was like, hey, just give me a minute with him. And I I thought that lightning was going to strike in this moment, you know. So I was standing back trying to listen to as much as I could. But you gave them this speech about why we're here and why they should be excited about it. And you got those boys pumped up. And you didn't raise your voice. You you showed them some empathy. Like, I could see you're, I could see you're nervous. And... Uh, Watching, watching that interaction, and then they were all four, uh, all turtled up and ready to go inside. And they did okay. They didn't do great, but they did okay. Two out of two out of four ain't bad. Two out of four ain't bad. That was not the same group, by the way. That uh, that two. Well, the other ones that threw up in their masks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We started off with four, ended up with two. Yeah. Had two out back trying to clear out something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, my takeaway from that that I really didn't apply. Uh, I hadn't been promoted yet, so you ever learn a lesson that you can't apply for years, and then you get into a position, and you're like, oh, I, I know what to do here. And uh, and that moment, I've used that. Uh, Be like me. You might want to rethink that. I know. Yeah, it's, it's scary to think, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, I've i tried to take that approach, that, uh, that calm, uh, hey, this is what we're doing here. It doesn't make – I mean, you can ask guys back in the day. I mean, my famous thing was – Pulling up on the scene, not giving a size up, not giving nothing. Because if you give the competition a size up or something, they step up their game. If you don't say nothing, they don't know. Right. It got to be to the point where 
they expected me not to say nothing, and they stepped up their game because they knew that something was on fire. Yeah, <laughs> they were like, he's not talking. Yeah. He's working. No. So I got in a lot of trouble for that over the years. Yeah. <laughs> That's outstanding. It's all I, good. I like you more and more the more stories I hear. <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine what that would be like now mm-hmm. <laughs> to pull up on a scene and not give a size up. Yeah. <laughs> well, the truck guys usually had to get, try to give a size up. Well, I think the engine laid out from <laughs> here and here, and they're there, and yeah, there's fire showing and whatever. So, yeah. Can There's, I tell you another quick story real quick? Oh, please. I, I yeah. love this one. This is one of my favorites. So there's a guy named Billy Croson who's the senior wagon driver at 10 Engine. He's still there. It just If you knew Billy, you'd know. Not taking any away from anybody else that ever drove me there, but Billy's, I'll give Billy this one. I wasn't relieved yet, and he was there. And uh, we ran a car fire or medical or something, I don't even know. And I wasn't relieved, and I was pissed. It was like four in the morning. And uh, we were back in the firehouse, and they put out a box. We were third due. It was in Engine 18's area. And they were getting out of bed because it was Engine 18. So Billy said, you know we're going to smoke him. And uh, I said, okay. So he what he did was, so in D.C., first due lays out. Third dude picks up first dude. Second dude lays out, goes to the rear. Fourth dude picks up second dude. Fifth dude is ripped right off the get-go on the engine company side. First dude truck the front, second dude truck the rear. You get there, you get there. If you don't, you're still responsible for it. The squad guys park out of the way, block it to the way. Don't, don't block us out. So anyway, what Billy did this day, he pulled up to the front of the building. It was a end of the row, two-story. We had... Pretty decent fire on the second floor. We pulled our 400 pre-connect, inch and a half, by the way. So that's a whole nother deal. Yeah. And we pulled that and stood there, and he drove. We took the first 150 feet off. He drove the rest of the way down the street to where we knew 18 was going to lay out from. Never said shit on the radio, not one word. Went upstairs. I, I mentioned Jack Lascure earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is proper technique there was a side light took the bail broke the glass reached around opened it up and we went we're upstairs billy charges the line 18's not even there yet so this guy i'm not going to say his name but in charge of 18 that day this is his size up 18's laying out from i don't know eighth and c or seventh and c i don't remember where it was um there's fire shown on the second floor there's a line going through the front door and looks like they're getting a knock on it. <laughs> Conway was the second chief that day. He says, Italian two to engine 10. You mind telling me what you got? And that's how that went down. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a true story. Yep. He knew it was engine 10. Oh, well, he knew it was us because yeah. just two tours ago, we did the same thing, did like eight engines. So whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I like your style. If I'm not first deal, it's not my job to give a size up. If I beat you there, sorry about your luck. Yeah. Yeah. It's still <laughs> your job to do a size yeah, up. You do your size up and talk on the radio all you want. We're going to do what we got to do. And that's why I got put in timeout more than once. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Yeah. yeah well. You need a few more fingers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, you know what? I wouldn't trade it for nothing. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, you got to be you, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I talk to Hoffman uh, sometimes about uh, after I make my decisions and do my things, I'm brushing my teeth. I got to look at myself in the mirror. and That's why they're so pearly white. That's why they're so white. Yeah. I brush them about six or seven times a day. Uh, doesn't everybody do that? That's straight up anal. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> That's straight, straight up anal. <laughs> <laughs> Back to talking about the live burn stuff. If you're okay with that, uh, we'll leave the uh, the special dinner live burn. That was a, a pretty house. Yep. Yep. I uh, almost hated to burn it, except that it had six million fleas in there. Do you remember that right before we started? It was horrible. I yeah. was <laughs> <laughs> like, what is this? Yeah. I came out and I looked down at my legs and I'm like, something's not right. I thought I was in a cow field. I was covered. I was, yeah, I, it was bad. Yeah. That was insane. Um, so, 
Uh, and we're still not going to say where that was. No. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. Uh, so th- I learned in that one. I told you the, the lessons that I learned. Mm-hmm. But uh, um, what were some of those in the live burn setting from the time that you started in uh, 2007? Is that what you said? Somewhere around there, yeah. Yeah. What is that like for, for somebody that's uh, sitting in your shoes? I think the lessons learned is you got to adapt to your environment. Uh, North Carolina is a big state. Um, and the way things are done in different parts of the state, it's just a different culture, and you got to adapt to that culture and not look down on it or n- not look up to it, but adapt to it and, you know, work with the people you got with you. Um, in the southeastern part of the state, things are done a whole lot differently than they are around the Charlotte area. Sure. Um, so that's that's the biggest thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to put anybody down. You just adapt. But it's up to the instructors to adapt. As It's not up to students. It's up to us to adapt. And uh, you know, uh, even you guys down here. Um, I mean, I've been around with you for a while, and I've done a few with you. Um, you, you do have to adapt to your surroundings. That's the biggest thing, I think. And, uh, and try to be as, uh, you know, in, in encourage and and trust and get get the people on your side before you make a run with them because yeah. as you know i mean we had some before the, all the rules changed we we used to do some burning yeah so you know if they trust you and trust what you say to them and, and as long as they entrust in you you're gonna they're gonna perform and they come out of it better as you come out of it better I mean, every burn I've been in, I've learned something. Yeah, I, I would say that's a safe statement. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. sure. <clears throat> so. On that on that topic of you, you said it right then. The things changing in the live burn scene. What? Why do you think that is? Uh, just everything. The whole culture has changed. I mean, back in the day, you know, we. I can remember sitting in the training academy. Back in '85, with with Chief Schneider going out there, we were all in civilian, oh, not civilian clothes, but our uniforms, no, no turnout gear, no nothing. We were in the burn building, and they set a fire in the corner. It was called Introduction to Smoke. We all sat there in a circle, and he sat there and yelled at us as this stuff went from here to here to here to here to here. And you didn't bail out; that just that was the culture back then. I mean, I'm not saying it was right, but that's the way it was. Nowadays, I mean, good Lord, if you did that now, you'd be hung out to try. Yeah. So, I mean, you just got to adapt and overcome. I mean, times have changed, and I get it. And I'm not saying what we did back in the day was right or wrong, but that's the way it was. That's right. And uh, that's, that's, that's really all I got to say about that. You just got to adapt to the times and adapt to the culture you're in and adapt to where you are, the area you're in, and understand what they're used to and what they're not used to and, and try to – mold them to become better people and better firemen. Yeah. So. Yep. I, um, when I met you in the uh, live burn setting, I told you, uh, when we were at dinner, <laughs> uh, I, I thought you were the salty, uh, guy, which you are. Nah. Uh, when I met chief year ago, uh, it was a very similar, like, Oh my God, look at this guy. Like, <laughs> year goes your go. He sure is. Your go. We go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when'd you meet him? <clears throat> um, about the same time when I started doing this with Ken, he was involved with it back in the day too. So, and we were all a lot younger then. Yeah. And we're going back now. Yeah. Chief uh, worked at Charlotte. Is that right? He did. I think Dave had 32 or 33 years on when he retired from Charlotte. So, yeah. You said Dave. I've never. Uh, it, He's I had a first name? Yeah. I thought I, on his birth I certificate never, it said <laughs> Chief. Yeah. I never knew he had a first name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that mustache definitely has its own name. Yeah. Zip code. Yeah. Dave's mustache has its own zip code, and it's for had sure. it for many years. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a garage door. You got to get past it to put it. Well, in. when you eat, you got to go here. You got to go low to high. There ain't yeah. no east west. It's yeah. it's south to north. <laughs> what was the joke we had running uh, through the crowd? Yurgo Yurgo's mustache comes in the it comes in the room, and then. Chief's behind him. Yeah. yeah. A couple minutes later, your yeah, shows, right. up. Yeah. shows up. <laughs> but a lot of knowledge there. A lot yeah. of experience. Absolutely. That guy's a rock star. So, 
Yeah. He's done a phenomenal job we're over there in Whiteville where he's at now, taking them from where he where they were when he showed up and where they are now. Is a yeah. pretty incredible little story. I like his humble nature. He's very humble. Yeah. yeah. Man, a few words. But when he speaks, it's like the old Dean Witter commercial. When Yurgo speaks, the whole room is like. Yeah, it's like the world stops spinning. Exactly. What, is, yeah. what, is, what is he getting ready to say? Absolutely. You're exactly right. Yep. I've noticed between yourself, Yurgo, Ken, and some of the other guys, you know, I put you guys under a microscope because yeah. I'm like a kid and Wonderful. a sponge. No, I'm, it's, it's for retaining information. I watch and I listen. All my receptors are turned on at every live burn. It's been like that for me. One thing I've noticed about you particularly, why the long coat? Because I got burnt uh, right at the top of the crack of my ass, basically, okay. in my lower back. And I have a section back there that the skin graft never really took. So even uh, uh, when we went to uh, bunker pants and short coats back in, I don't know, right around 90, I don't even remember when it was at this point, I was always, uh, I always had that little doctor's note say that he still needs a long coat. And that's why I always wore a long coat. I'll it looks you want to see? I it? No, I figured there was a. You I figured me, there was a reason. You want me to stand up and show you? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you do. <laughs> no, but I, f I figured there was a reason. Uh, yeah, you that's know, why. A reason behind it. That's why. It's interesting. Yep. Yeah. I've heard uh, Steve tell your story about your short, pick-headed axe. That's <laughs> that's that's funny. I do. <laughs> I always carried uh, a lot of everybody carried halogen bars. This, that, and the other thing. Well, the axe that I carried was a, a replica of the original Seagrave fire axe. And it was weighted such that it was a stainless steel head, and it was really, really heavy, and I had a pretty short handle on it, like 27, 28-inch handle on it. I had it made out of hickory. And uh, the reason I like that so much is maybe, no, it wouldn't be as effective as a halogen sometimes with two or three locks on door, but normally you could take that thing and punch punch a door, you could punch a window, you could do whatever you wanted to. But my favorite thing to do was, <laughs> if you're a third do engine and the first two engines sitting up at the top of the stairs and they're not doing a whole lot of moving for whatever reason, or looking on their pop school or whatever they're doing, you slide up that there and take that pick head and just slide it up between somebody's leg and, you know, first thing you do is, hey man, y'all, you know, this is yours, go get it. Hey man, y'all gonna move? Third time, slide it up there through, give a little tug tug on the nutsack. They drop like a flower and off you went and put out the fire. So that's just the way it works. Yeah. A little a little pull of encouragement. Just a little get, get out of my way. Little 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 tug. Does Probar have that in the instruction manual of uh, of how to use that? I don't believe so. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh I think this axe is built. I'm gonna, I'll give a little plug. I think it was I think it's called Fire Axe Unlimited. They're out of California or something. But they they own the forge to the original Seagrave Fire Axe, which back in the day, you, know, you, bought, a, you bought a Seagrave, you get an axe. Yeah, right. you. So that's, yeah, I still have that thing. That's uh, That thing's my pride and joy. That's awesome. If they still exist, I'll, uh, I'll have to order one up. Sure. Yeah. It is. I think it's called Fire Axe Incorporated or something like that. Yeah. They're, off, they're out of the West Coast. I'll so, check into that for sure. Yeah, it's pretty badass. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So you don't have to sharpen it like a hal again, like all you truck guys like to do. Go to the grinder, make sure your edges are nice and sharp. <laughs> yeah, and it's that, so that, true. That. I 100% so, I know they do. So true. I know yeah. they do. Well, you yeah. want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Engine and truck stuff? I think that's a great idea. Right. What you got? Man, uh, <laughs> first we have to have a really good pillow. Uh, that's very important. Yep. I like a... Uh, I like not too thick, you know. I like it. Did you have two? Two pillows? Yeah, so when you roll over on your side, you have something to cuddle to? Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> we call that one the body pillow. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's always been amazing to me how after the truck guys go to bed at night that for whatever reason they don't get up. I don't get it. I mean, we run all the shit-ass medicals and all the other things. All of it. Yep. And... Uh, 
you know, that's why that story I told a few minutes ago, we were backing in for a medical local and we crushed everybody. That's what made it all worthwhile. Yeah. Didn't happen all the time. Right. But it worked out good. It worked out good sometimes. Yeah. So, yeah, I loved, uh, even though I spent a lot of time in the truck, I called it being putting time out until you had a chance to get to a good engine. Mm hmm. Our, uh, in our organization, uh, I heard you run off earlier what a box was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we get three engines, a truck, a rescue, battalion, and safety. Mm -hmm. um, the first engine pulling a line, second one's going to get water supply, third engine's going to go straight to Ritz. So you all do not lay out going in, first two? No. Really? Okay. Yep. So um, uh, truck company and rescue, we're racing. Uh, for whoever gets to do search and the first one of you takes search and the other one does vent okay yeah uh those being our our top two priorities in our organization we can also uh operate as an engine so uh if we're first due then we that's because you have hose on a ladder truck that's true mm -hmm. yep i know that uh in some places <laughs> that's not normal <laughs> yeah uh, you get south of the Mason Dixon line. That's that's kind of the norm, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting that that's a, a geographic thing. Well, I mean, eh, that's not even true. I mean, I guess Maryland. Maryland's still pretty much you're either an engine or a truck. There's not a lot of quints up that way. Virginia is where it kind of gets mixed, and then south of there is kind of where the whole quint thing picks up again. Yeah. Uh, so I know with your current job and stuff, do you see? Do you still see the kind of Quint thing going on in some of the bigger cities in the South? Or is I mean, it... look at Charlotte. I mean, every one of their letters is a Quint. Okay. So, I mean, I Georgia, get it. Georgia, Florida, so on. Oh uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, Georgia, it's, it's kind of a mix. Right. Uh, Florida, again, kind of a mix. I mean, you get into places in, in Florida, Jacksonville's. I think Jacksonville is probably the closest thing to D.C. in the southeast. I mean, they're, they're engine-oriented, truck-oriented. Um, uh, you get further south than that, there's, there's a big mix. I mean, it, it all comes down to staffing. I mean, I get sure. it. I mean, if you're a smaller department or even a you know 10 or 12 engine and a couple ladder trucks, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, but it's just uh, not the culture I'm used to, but I don't. I'm not going to hate on it. I mean, it is what it is. What was the uh, first truck's responsibility in, uh, in D.C.? Back in the day? Mm -hmm. All right, so you had, a, obviously, a truck driver, a tillerman, officer, hookman, barman, and hookman. Um, basically, you throw ladders. Is somebody yeah, going to the roof on that first truck? Your your truck driver and your tillerman are going upstairs to the roof. Um, your officer is going to dictate, depending on the situation, what was going on. Um, your barman went with the engine company to Fort Century. And uh, your, your basically your other two guys threw ladders and supported whatever. It all depended on what you were going up against. Sure. Yeah. You know? If it was uh, like a, a city block setting, I guess the roof team would give a, a report from the back of the building. No, that's the second two trucks' responsibility. Okay. And everybody's right on top of each other, so it didn't take long. Sure. Uh, but back in the day, like I told about earlier, I mean, with two engines in a truck, yeah. I mean, you, you did it all. It yeah. didn't matter. So that's going back, you know, 25, 30 years. So well, 30 years at this point. Yeah. So. Uh, did you guys uh, go on peaked roofs in D.C.? Yeah. Yeah. And it was flat, peaked. I mean, we there was really there's there's an there's not a lot of really tall buildings in D.C., but there, you can get every, every kind of building construction you could possibly think of. Yeah, I know uh, FDNY does uh, no personnel on peaked roofs policy. So uh, we didn't have that policy. Yeah, no, you cut a hole, you could cut a hole. Yeah, I mean that's why we had roof ladders. Yeah, maybe they have more snow and ice and stuff to worry about. I don't. Uh, know. I don't. Really, yeah. I, just, I don't know what their deal is up there with the truck stuff, so I yeah. couldn't speak on that. So, uh, second one, second truck uh, handles a report from the Charlie side, or second dude truck is responsible for the rear. I mean, the barman on the second dude truck's going to force entry into a basement if need be for the second new engine. 
Um, you know, in D.C., we had alleys off of alleys off of alleys sometimes. Right. And you know, there's a lot of times you couldn't position your apparatus back there, but you were certainly responsible for laddering it or doing whatever you had to do. You just did what you had to do to make it happen. Um, cutting bars, a lot of bars up there. Um, you know, basically, you know, first dude truck took care of the front of the building, second dude truck, took, you know, took care of the rear of the building. And as far as uh, uh, B and D, I mean, you split it up. If it wasn't a row house, whatever, it all depends on what you were running. I mean, garden apartments, we had a lot of them. Um, not a lot of height, but, you know, a lot of, you know, long, long rows. And like I said, alleys off valleys off valleys. So, yeah, it got interesting. Pretty condensed area as far as population goes. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And now all the, you know, <laughs> you can probably edit this, but they asked me when I retired why. And I said four reasons. I said, hipsters, yuppies, cell phones, and paramedics have fucked up a really good ghetto. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> no way we're editing that out. Yeah, way. no, that's yeah, not a chance. But it's yeah. true. I mean, the job has just evolved, and everything's everything's wrapped around EMS now, which I get, you know, whatever. It is what it is, but, you know, it's the, everything's changed. The culture's changed. Um, but it's true. I mean, yeah. it's, it's the whole culture's changed, man. I mean, I'm not downgrading anything or anybody. I mean, you got to adapt and overcome. And I understand the income, you know, tax base, blah, 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 if they don't want to run third service. I mean, D.C. back in the day took over the BLS ambulance service and added more firemen to the job. I think we added several hundred more uniform strength to our job for that. I mean, yeah, it was burden. And from a company officer standpoint, it sucked. You know, there was times where you had to detail guys out and do whatever. And, but, you you know, as an overall thing, from a uniform strength of the of the department overall, it was probably a better thing. But, I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad I'm not there anymore. Yeah. Miss my guys. Don't miss the politics. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the truck thing. So, uh, if we're taking search... Where there's no crew to split, and you go do this and do that. Uh, so we're finding the fire, uh, reporting that, and then searching away from there. Is that is that how it's done up there? No. No? I'm going to let a truck guy know where my fire is. I got news for you. Negative. Negative. Your job is to get me in. If I can't get in, you know, that, go throw a ladder or cut a hole and stand there. And look what I did. Yeah. Shepherd. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Eat to your sleepy, sleep to your hungry. Mm-hmm. Truck guy. It's it's amazing. It's it's so amazing hearing hearing your stories and the way it is now, and you talking about the culture change. It's it's so prevalent. It's it's true. That it's, it is very true. It's very true. I came in in two thousand five, so you know you talk about getting with Ken and stuff in two thousand seven. So it's towards you know towards the end of your career. So I'm, and I came from a really tiny department, Clinton, North Carolina, um, but it was paid, and I would say our tempo was relatively high. We didn't run medical calls, we didn't do any of that. Ours was fires, alarms, NVCs. So, and there was probably more fires than there was alarms. Very rural, mm-hmm. I mean, lots of uh, single family occupations, stuff like that. So I got a, I got a little bit of that, and I had some, had some great people like you to bring me up through it. So I'm. I feel you on the culture change, you know, just in my short time. I've, I've you know, I, I can feel that kind of temperature change throughout it. Um, it's refreshing to hear you talk about it, it. That's everywhere, though. It's, sure. not, it's not local. It's everywhere. You know, it's just it's the way things are now. Yeah. And we're not going to farms anymore. Right. Not really. Not like yeah. back in the day. Yeah. Comparatively, the numbers are. No, the yeah. numbers aren't there. So you gotta you got to sustain your existence. So I get that. Yeah, that's why I'm so glad I'm retired. Right. <laughs> it looks good on you, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happier but, now than I was when you knew me a few years ago. Yeah. Before yeah. we get into your what you're doing now, because I do want to get into that. Oh my. Um, I do want to get into that. But uh, what's some advice you can give officers, firemen, people like that nowadays? You just got to adapt with the change, adapt with what you got in front of you. I mean, 
administrations change like hemorrhoids. I mean, sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small. And you got to follow you got to follow it. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, you're not going to like every boss you work for. And depending on the size of your department, what are you going to do? You know, you want you want to work there, you want to be a fireman. You got to adapt and overcome. I mean, you follow the rules, you do what you got to do, and but you tell your guys, you know, rules don't always dictate fire ground. You know, you got to do what's right before you worry about what's in an order book. And then as an officer, you got to deal with it. You know, if you get put in timeout, you get put in timeout. But you, if you know you did the right thing at the end of the day, that's what you're going to do. I mean, that's – I don't even know how else to address that. I mean, things have changed so much. And I've been out of it for a few years now. So, I mean, all I do now is just go around and flow water. So You nailed it. That was, so, that was great. I don't, yeah. I don't need to, I don't need to do no, anymore now. That. No, that was yeah. great. So, keep working out and drinking muscle milk. Muscle milk. Yeah. I feel like I'm sitting here around a couple of MMA guys or something. Right. The only guy I'm friends with in the room is you. Me, me and you are good. <laughs> so That's awesome. <laughs> All right, break. 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 <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck, y'all? <laughs> that's all <the> shit. <laughs> oh, that tickled me. <laughs> Those rank structures are interesting. Yeah. It's very yeah. interesting. I've heard you say private, sergeant, lieutenant, technician. So, lieutenant, did I say lieutenant already? Captain. Yeah, no, so, it's, I mean, um, if you're a fireman, fireman's fireman, whatever, <clears throat> driver's jobs up there are insane to get. I mean, there's times where guys wait 15, 20 years on the back step to get a driver's job. It's all about seniority. It sounds like a dream. And, you know, so how we promote up there to technicians, so to speak, is um, as officers, company officers, we get together and we give what, a tech exam in-house. We don't do map books. There's no such thing as a fucking map book up there. you got to know, period. With all those drivers up there study. It usually takes a year, year and a half of studying to even get a driver's job. So, you know, there's no map books in the front of that fire truck. You know, you got to know streets, splits, alleys, hydrants for the truck guys, gas cutoffs, this, that, and the other thing. So we give an in-house exam. And whoever passes that, whatever, then then it gets, that's only half the battle. So you don't get it, you don't even get to go to the academy if you don't get out of in-house. You get out of in house, you go to the academy, and then it's ifs to shit and all the other crazy dumb shit they do, and then this driving test out on the course, and you get put through scenarios and pump scenarios, and you know I'm gonna fucking crash your pump, and you got to recover, and yeah. blah blah blah. So all these scores get cumulative. So the last guy that drove me was Dave Harris, and he beat out the other two guys by less than one point. It was percentage points. And seniority comes into play too. I mean, you get points for seniority. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the, the fucking drivers up there is no joke, man. Those guys are. It's harder to get promoted to driver, like especially in an engine company, at like a ten. I mean, ten had the biggest fucking box alarm in the city. I mean, we gave technicians exams of fucking splits and alleys and shit, fucking first and second due on the second alarm, because the guys knew the shit around our box alarm so well. It wasn't even fair. Yeah, you know, but it was it was that stupid. So, you know, drivers were the backbones, and I had some of the best. I had a guy named Greg Thompson, black guy, about this tall. Well, about yeah, about this tall. That motherfucker was a wizard. That fucking guy knew shit that <laughs> the trash guy didn't even know. Right. I'm serious, man. That's it, so it, cool. You know, Greg was, you know, he was my driver the first time I was there. He was the driver the second time I was there. And uh, he retired. We, he, I, he retired while I was there. And he was, and that fucking guy, that fucking guy was amazing. And then uh, another guy named Dwayne Reeder, who was, worked on the shift before me. Damn. And, and Greg sure. Dean. Greg Dean, you know who he is? Greg Dean? Yeah. He was a fire chief in D.C. He came. He was a fire chief in Seattle, believe it or not. Worked all the way through the ranks, became fire chief out there. He was fire chief there for like 10 years. I think you know this story. So I was a 
Seniority up there, rank means shit, but seniority means more. So Danny Troxel was the most senior officer on the fucking job. I was number two. Danny was the captain, I was the lieutenant. They put us in the same house on the same shift. Danny was captain truck 13, I was lieutenant 10 engine. The number one and number two senior fucking guys on the whole fucking job officer wise. So Dean comes there as a fire chief. So what does he do? Every Friday and Saturday night when me and Danny are working, shows up in a pair of blue jeans and a shirt, T-shirt with DCFD on it and rides the back step. Wow. Outstanding. Did that for like three months. Wow. Before, he was just one of those guys who didn't really say anything, just sit back and watch, see what's up, see what's up, see what's up. So fuck yeah, I have a lot of respect for that guy. Even though everybody else talks a lot of blah, 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 they didn't fucking know. But every weekend, that guy was there riding with us. And that was outstanding. And yeah. I told him many a time, Chief, front seat? He said, nope. And he sat right in the middle. Right, yeah. right in the middle of the back. Right. On the back fucking mind. step. Yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> so he was the one He's the one that asked me that question at my retirement dinner. It wasn't just me. It was four of us. It was four guys. So they did the dinner for us. Yeah. And he was the one that asked me that question that I gave that answer to. The four reasons I left. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, I have a lot of respect for that guy. He's he's pretty fucking rock solid. I don't agree with everything, okay. Okay. but you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. When did you get into uh, your next job after retirement? So I went to work for uh, right before I retired. Uh, I don't know if we were recording into this, but Dwayne Reeder, one of the wagon drivers at Ten Engine, um, lived in Delaware and commuted to DC. And he was friends with a guy named Brian Bashista, who is the vice president of Atlantic Emergency Solutions, who is now, they are now the largest Pierce dealer in North America. They just acquired Finley Fire Equipment. Um, so they not only have the Delaware, Maryland, D.C., uh, Virginia, uh, North Carolina, they're, they've now expanded to West Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio. So they're, they're big time. Anyway, Brian was friends with Dwayne. Um, I, I went and sat down with Brian up in Delaware right before I retired, and I actually went to work for Atlantic Emergency as an equipment guy. So I did my thing and went around and tried to sell equipment, and I was new at the game, and, and I really had never been much of a salesman. and It was kind of tough, but I did that for a little bit, and that was in uh, August of 2016, right after I retired. Went to work for them. And Key Hoes was one of um, Atlantic's products that they sold. And uh, I got to get to, you know, doing some demos and flows and stuff with a guy named Mark Lighthill. Mark is, uh, or he retired as the number two in Brevard County, Florida. He had uh, 30 years down there. Uh, he was the assistant chief. And went to work for, well, he started work for Elkhart and then he went to Key. And uh, he called me up one day and, you know, we talked and uh, I ended up leaving Atlantic with Brian's blessing and uh, became the Southeast Regional Manager for Key Firehose. And that's what I've been doing for the last four years, basically. So my states are uh, the Carolinas, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and Mississippi. And in the last four years, I've flowed with literally hundreds of departments. And uh, what I do as a factory rep is evaluate where you want to be, what you want to do, and uh, try to come up with the best solution for you. I mean, I deal with big municipalities, um, you know, Charlotte, uh, Jacksonville, Miami-Dade, I mean, everywhere in between. And uh, I flowed with, you know, six or eight volunteer departments in the in the Western North Carolina Hills, and I've been down in, you know, Miami-Dade flowing water. Yeah. So um, it's, it's, it's challenging. Um, when departments are looking to put stuff out to bid, I help them work through a spec, a written spec, because when things go out to bid, it has to be very specific. And in the, believe it or not, in the fire hose industry, things are very specific, and you got to be very careful how you word things. So I drive around or fly or do whatever and flow water. And uh, 
hook up gauges and give people real numbers and um, that's what I do now. I can imagine you meet a uh, wide range of folks in the I industry. Do. Yeah, I meet a lot of different folks and uh, you know the cool thing is you, you get surprised every once in a while. You go to a place where you're thinking hmm you know whatever and these guys really are dialed in. They know. I mean they're, they're hose junkies. Um, you know, back before I started all doing all this, the, the nozzle companies are the ones that changed the game. Um, they all came out with these low pressure nozzles. Um, I mean, traditionally everybody flowed with a you know 100 psi selectable gallon of Jackrin or Elkhart or one of the old you know SM20 or 30 Elkhart nozzles, the automatics and stuff. And you know, they nobody really knew anything about how much water they were getting out of things. So NFPA kind of changed the game a little bit too. You know, NFPA, everybody tries to follow NFPA, but NFPA is really recommendations. And some adhere to it and some don't. But it's recommendations at the end of the day. So what you do is you go around and talk to different people and you find out uh, where they want to be, how many GPM they want to flow, what are they, how many GPM do they want to flow with a couple rooms in a hallway, What's their staffing? I mean, do they have two hundred truck? Do they have three hundred truck? Four hundred truck? Five hundred truck? I mean, you you just you have to take all these variables into into account and try to come up with a decent game plan for these folks. So at the end of the day, they're they're happy as the end user, and uh, you know they're they're doing what they need to do to serve their community. So it's challenging. Uh, it's it's something new. I mean, I I was fortunate enough to be around. You know, there's four of us sitting in here. I mean, in a room in contents where I came from, there'd be 20 guys sitting in here. Right. You know, but you know that's not everywhere, and you got to be you got to be sensitive to that, and you got to you got to try to come up with what's best for them. And uh, that's what I do. I flow water. I try to come up with the best package for them to deal with. You know. If, if you're the fire chief somewhere and you tell me you have two guys on a truck and three stations, so there's six on duty, and you want to flow, you know, our combat ready or whatever that's geared for 185 gallons a minute, my first question to you is, all right, how are you going to do that? What, are you going to have one guy holding on to that? No, you gotta you got to work with guys. you gotta, you got to figure out what's best for them. So um, I like what I do, and... Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's Some of your uh, conversations, um, you know, we're, earlier we were talking about how the uh, the engineers are kind of the backbone. They are. Uh, one, uh, in my firehouse, uh, because of the hose that we got from you, it flows so much more. Um, he was proposing, instead of us flying a, a Y, we call it flying a Y, mm -hmm. sending a two and a half out. Yeah, for uh, setbacks. Yeah, he's like, with this hose, we can run 300, 400 feet. I still flow a lot of gallons per minute. And uh, so we're, we're and your touring. truck's not jumping off the ground. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, in your industry. I bet you have have a lot of those uh, fun conversations. Uh, do you hear some of that? Those ideas from other departments? Well, that's my job. I mean, you know, I listen. I listen. What I do at any, any department I get to, I listen, and, and I ask a few questions, and then I try to, you know, mold a kind of a game plan together for them. Um, I mean, where I came from, we had a 400-foot pre-connect inch and a half, where the engine PDP was 220, not even including elevation. Right. I mean, guys, we, we there was times we'd take that 400 and run it up back stairwell while the other ones were fiddle-fucking around with a standpipe, and we'd have a fire out before they hooked up and did everything they needed to do. Right. So, in, you know, again, I mentioned the, the nozzles. You know, they came out with these low-pressure fogs, 50 PSI. Mm -hmm. And, you know, same as a smoothbore. So it was up to the hose companies to build a hose that could perform well with a 50 PSI nozzle pressure. And uh, most of us have done that. I mean, just about every hose company out there has, you know, done the right thing. <coughs> some, some perform better than others. I'm not going to get into a pissing match. I mean, sure. if, if nozzles and hoses are paired up well, the end user is happy. That's the bottom line. And there's a lot of variables, and there's not nearly enough time to not get into all that. Right. <laughs> there is a little bit of a science to it. Sure. Um, but that's uh, that's kind of what I do. 
Yeah. That's not kind of what it is. That's what I do. That's what you do. Yeah. yeah. What have you seen as far as the technology changes from what you started with in your career and as it's progressed into the oh company that you work for now? Uh, I mean, back in the day, we were still using cotton hose, okay? Right. You got done, you cleaned it, you hung it in the hose tower, and you did whatever. I mean, today, I mean, you, you talk about EPDM rubber, nitrile rubber. I mean, there's, there's the technology has just gone... Um, it's, it's nowhere near the same. That's not even a fair comparison, <laughs> right? I mean, the, the 80s and 90s were one way. I mean, I can remember when I was working. I mean, I didn't give two shits about it, what hose we used. When the shop showed up, we needed hose, stake body pull up. Everybody go out front and grab hose and put it on the rack. I mean, but, you know, in that scenario, we had enough people that you didn't have to worry about a pinch point. I mean, it's like FDNY. They have enough staffing too. They don't have to worry about pinch points. Well, they don't have to worry about it anymore because they use our hose. But anyway, right? Um, <laughs> you know, you you don't need to worry about that. But when you get down to you know places that have you know three of us in a room that are going to put out a fire in a house, then then it becomes an issue. So, yeah, the technology to answer you is is come a, a long long way, but the nozzle guys started it. We didn't start it. Gotcha. Yeah. Is the reason the hose seems a little more stiff is to be able to put up with that uh, 50 psi instead of the. Every hose is designed differently, but yes, um, you know, every hose has a certain pick count. There's so many pieces of material that go this way. There's so many pieces of material that go that way. It depends how many twists you put in it, and with the growth of the strands that you put in it, and whatever variation that may be, is how the hose performs. I mean, we make bargain basement hose too. I mean, there's departments out there that have a twenty-five thousand dollar a year budget. What are you going to do? They got to yeah. have hose. Got to have hose. You know, they'd love to have the top grade stuff, but it's just not realistic. Uh, then you get into the municipalities where you got all these hose and nozzle junkies, like nozzle forward. All these nozzle forward guys. Oh my God, you know, God forbid that you can't whip that thing around and hit your points and sweep the floor and, you know, right. There's that, and then there's the you know. The regular guys so uh, we make hose for everybody yeah we make hose for everybody. we're the we're the largest hose manufacturer in the world we pump out nearly a million linear feet of hose a week Jeez. out of our factory um, and there's complications to go with that uh, especially during this covid thing um, from a manufacturing standpoint and from a sales standpoint too i mean there's a lot of departments out there that just aren't allowed to see people I don't yeah. cold call anybody. I mean, no, yeah. I'm, where I go, I'm scheduled. Yeah. Uh, but you know, from I manage a, a enormous staff of our sales. You know, our companies that sell our product, and it's my responsibility to train them and and get them to say the right things and do the right things. But uh, this this whole COVID thing has made it pretty difficult for a lot of people. How big is that factory? Uh. This, we have two factories, actually. Uh, our main facility is in Dothan, Alabama. Uh, our second facility is in Cottonwood, Alabama, which is about 30 miles or so southwest of Dothan. And uh, we have different process in both factories. We do one way in Dothan, and most of our industrial, we have a really large industrial business as well. Uh, most of that's made in, in Cottonwood. It's made under a different process. But I'm not going to get into sure. that tonight because sure. we'd yeah. be here all night in, talking uh, about in that. In non-COVID times, uh, how many personnel would be found in one of those, you reckon? Uh, two or three shifts, depending on what the what the uh, order book is. Uh, we, we employ several hundred people. I'd say that uh, running that many linear feet out, it seems yeah. like that would be a yeah. pretty much around the clock type of pretty manufacturing much. process. So, I mean, raw materials come in one end of the plant and they go through a process, and the shipping docks on the other end of the plant where it's get packed in trucks every day. Yeah. Uh, I think we just shipped well over a million dollars worth of hose to FDNY on this last order, and there's more to come. So, um, that's just one example. Um, Miami-Dade is huge. Cal Fire is huge. I mean, Cal Fire had a tough time this year. They had a tremendous fire season. Sure. Uh, we had to readjust several looms to dedicate to making forestry hose. 
uh, to make sure they were up to speed on where they needed to be. I mean, they those guys took an ass whipping this year. They really did. Uh, a lot of politics, a lot of whatever. It doesn't matter. But sure. the guys out there dealing with all that every day don't care about the politics and this and that. And then we we stepped up and made sure that they were taken care of. But uh, it's and the reason I mentioned that is I just watched that thing on Discovery the other night. Do you all see that? No. That Cal Fire thing. No, yeah, it's a short it. miniseries. It's 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 a good it's a good watch. Is that on Netflix? Um, no, it's on Discovery. Discovery. Yeah, I'll check it out. It started this sure. past Sunday, but uh, that's a that's a solid watch. I mean, I I you know never really thought about that whole aspect of things until I got into this job and know some of the things that have gone on. But I have a lot of respect for those guys. Those guys are working on some pretty adverse conditions. Is there anybody that you can reflect back in your career that you looked up to going up through? Just kind of oh a, a mentor, Absolutely. or can you can you limit it maybe to a few? If you're like me, it's I have several, several, several. Yeah. Um, Any that stand out in your brain? When I was a rookie at Truck Eight. God, those words, busiest, busiest, those words yeah, just whatever. roll off your tongue so nicely. These three truck guys can <laughs> kiss my ass, but anyway. <laughs> Anyway, there's a, a man named Clarence Foreman who was old school, old technician from an old truck company over in Northwest D.C. Um, he was probably one of the most knowledgeable truck guys that I ever learned from. I mean, I really had no experience came where I came from. I mean, I, you know, I came from a volunteer department like everybody else. And yeah, we had a truck, but so right you know um but yeah clarence foreman was probably the first stronghold that really pointed me in the right direction Uh, another guy named steve seymour uh, was a lieutenant at the time at at 25 engine in the same house a lot of respect for that guy taught me a lot a guy named larry buck was a sergeant assigned to the truck. Well, I told you about the sergeants that floated. Mm-hmm. He ended up being my lieutenant at Rescue 3 when I, when I went to the rescue. Solid, solid dude. Um, uh, the list goes on and on. I mean, sure. But at, initially, I would say uh, Foreman, Seymour, and Buck were probably one of the biggest influences on me. From a, an officer standpoint, as being a private at the time, they're the ones that like molded me to think, and they might not think so. They, like, this guy's an asshole. I mean, who is this right. kid? You know, but no, they, those three guys really meant something. I mean, they, uh, I learned a lot from all three of them, and there was others. There's plenty of others. Sure, and yeah. guys like you know Lester Hansen and Ronnie Danner, and the list goes on and on and on. But, um, you know, as as you as I trans, transformed through the private ranks, and then when, once I got promoted, that started a whole nother thing. You know, when you're when you're a fireman and you're looking up to your officers and you learn things from different people, that's all well and good, and that kind of molds you and, and puts you in the mindset that you want to be in or where you want to be. When you become when you're promoted, you rely more on your drivers. They're the senior guys. They're the guys that are going to point you in the right direction. I mean, you get promoted as a new officer in a place. You don't know anything about your back step. You don't know anything about your company. Who are you going to rely on first? You're going to rely on the guy driving you because, number one, he's going to take you there. And, number two, he knows what's going on in the company. And that's that's kind of the progression from being a private to an officer. You rely on the, you know, the officers you have as a private, and then you rely on the drivers you have as an officer. Yeah. And, uh, you know... I had some really, really phenomenal guys over my career. I mean, I think we talked about it before. I, ta- I mentioned Billy Croson earlier, but, you know, he was on the other shift. But, you know, Greg Thompson. Greg Thompson is just an absolute legend on that job. And he drove me twice while I was at 10, two different times. Um, you know, Dave Harris, uh, Brian Thrasher. I mean, these guys – just just phenomenal guys. And as an officer, that's who you rely on. Sure. At my firehouse, we use that uh, after a run, we get back and we talk about the things we did wrong first. 
like or, or places we thought we could have improved. Um, is that traditional? Is that actually? I disagree with that. Okay. So I wouldn't wait till we got back. I'd wait till we were on the fire ground or in the in the wagon mm-hmm. on our way back, and we'd talk about it. I think that it's really important to point out something that might have got screwed up. Um, and then when you get back to the firehouse and you're in the sitting room, that's where you can unwind. I don't think that's where the tension needs to build. I think you need to take care of that before you, even if you pull over on the side of the road and have it out in the wagon. All right. When you get back to the firehouse, that needs to be where, you know, things have absorbed. Place of sanctitude, and, sure. And place of sanctitude. Yeah. That's, that's not the place you hash out problems. You hash that shit out on the street. I like it. That's okay. true, and yeah. that's that. I was actually I did that all the time, and I, now I don't think the guys realize till if they ever see this that why I did that. But no, I mean I think that the sitting room and when you get back to the firehouse, that's where you unwind, because you know five minutes later you could be back in some dumb shit again. Yeah. So don't I don't want to be the 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 sanctuary to be critical. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yep. Uh, that this is what I look like learning something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm serious though. Think yeah. about it. You it know, makes it, perfect sense. If you got a problem, yeah. perfect. Make it happen yeah. before you get back, and then when you get back, okay, reset. Yeah. Because ten minutes later, you could be doing some more dumb shit. Right. So, yeah. and then pull over again on your way back and hash yeah. it out, and then that's right. Go back to your go back yeah. to your happy. No place. run's gonna go perfect. No, yeah. it never does. I mean, yeah. and, you know, most of the time. Guys make stupid mistakes sometimes, but most of the time we're, we don't control how dumb shit goes. Yeah, the public controls how dumb shit goes, yeah. especially in the ghetto. It makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, and you know, even at a battalion level, um, some of the chiefs I work for, the especially the old school chiefs, that, that was one of their sanctuaries. You know, if you were going to get your ass chewed, it wasn't going to be in your sitting room. It was going to be on the fire ground before you left the fire ground. And yeah. if it got way deeper than that, well, that's, you know, if something really crazy happened, right. then it's going to be your company officer is the one that's going to get their ass chewed, and then he's going to determine how he talks to you all about it. Right. But, and the sitting room is a sanctuary. It's, it's wrong to turn it upside down because all it does is, you know, turn the balance of the whole shift upside down. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's good advice. Um, that's just how I was brought up, and I've always kept that on. Sorry, I don't look over there. All it's fine. fine. It's yeah. fine. I'm just infatuated with muscles over here. It's fine. Yeah. Don't yeah. think one word is coming out of your mouth is going past my ears. I right. promise. <laughs> I do not feel excluded. I'm, <laughs> I'm more right here than you think. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, no, that's, that's that's my theory on that. So. Yeah. I and that's only because that's how I was brought up. Yeah. yeah. It, and it I really agree does with make sense. solid wisdom mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Uh, the chief down at Carolina Beach. Alan Griffin. Alan Griffin. That's yep. it. Yeah. Uh, when did you meet Chief Griffin? Actually, I don't remember specifically where I met him, but um, Alan's a, he's a solid dude. And uh, when you first meet him, you're not quite sure what to think because he, you know, has different ideas and this and that and the other thing. But once you get to know Alan, he's he's solid, man. I would, uh, I, w- I would definitely put my next to him, name next to his at any time. Um, I've taught with him. Um, he has that uh, conference that he launched last year that kind of got sidetracked this year. Uh, we were able to get some big names to commit to him, uh, guys like Bill Gustin and some other big names out of the out of the big circuit. Mm-hmm. And uh, Alan's uh, he's an up and coming dude on the circuit. I can tell you that. Nice. Yeah, I'm glad and, to know uh, him. He's a uh, he's uh, like I said, he's he's a little rough around the edges when you meet him, but you know that's why I like him. Yeah, I can, right. just appreci- like I can him. appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, <laughs> Alan's his heart's in the right place. He's a dedicated dude. He's 100 percent fireman, and uh, I would I'm I'm proud to know him. Yeah, yeah. I've he's been with him on two two separate burns. The burn we did on college, and then one at his department. Mm-hmm. So. I, I Alan's all about his, being a fireman. Yeah, I've helped with two of his burns, so. and, uh, and knowing him on a personal level too, he's Alan's rock solid dude. Yeah, he um, had that firehouse upfitted. It's a nice place now. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, all about, he's all about he's all about being a fireman. 
and uh, he's in a position where he can help guys. I mean, you know, Carolina Beach has had their issues over the years, especially in the past, just like Oak Island and some mm-hmm. of the other things, you know. But, you know, the, the times have caught up with the coast. Yeah. That whole beach has done a 180. Yep. Yeah. Curie Beach and Carolina Beach both. Yep, exactly. Yeah, Curie, uh, what's that young kid's name that's far chief down there? He's he's pretty rock solid dude, too. I mean, he gets it. I'm, I don't know what he's like on the fire ground, but. Yeah, you both know. those beach departments are, uh, are, man, they stepped it, stepped it up. Yep. Yeah, their world's difference yeah. now than when I spent my time at Federal Point. Oh, absolutely, Point. yeah. 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 My the time fire at duty, Point, the fire duty in Carolina Beach is eight or nine. It's coming along. And that's, you know, that's the other <laughs> thing, too. People don't understand about the whole beach world. I mean, whether it's here in Wilmington or New Hanover or Carolina or, you know, Curry, or even Myrtle or Charleston or any of the rest, the whole thing down here is wind driven. You know, all the rules that everybody follows and, you know, all these guys want to critique about this is what you do, this is what you do, this is what you do. If you don't respect wind driven, you're going to have a bad day. You sure are. And, uh, you know, that's the other thing, you know, when I get into these beach towns, especially down in Florida, or actually the Alabama coast. I mean, Alabama beaches are some of the prettiest beaches in this country. I've been a lot of places, and let me tell you, that 60, 80 miles of Alabama beach, you ever want to go somewhere pretty? That's a good place to go, but wind-driven down there is huge. It's just like it is here, and it's not all across Florida. I mean, you get, you know, some of Florida, yeah, it's wind-driven, and the west coast of Florida, some of it's wind-driven. It, it really depends on what's going on. But the Carolinas, the Alabama coastline, the little Gulf Coast in there, I mean, the wind-driven thing is a big deal. And that, you know, people criticize tactics and they criticize this, but if they've never experienced that, you know, look what happened in Miami-Dade in Biscayne Bay. What was it, three Thanksgivings ago, four Thanksgivings ago, where they almost fried four or five guys? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's wind-driven for real. Yeah, I was unaware of that fire. Did uh, some windows finally burn through? or uh... What, in Biscayne? Mm-hmm. So, uh, I guess Bill Gustin is uh, a legend in Florida. He's a legend on the circuit in the country. I mean, he's probably, I think Bill's got 45, 46 years on the job. He spent most of his career as captain of one of the business engine companies in Miami-Dade. Engine 2, which is no joke. And, but he's he's a really big proponent of teaching high rise and this far happened uh, the, the problem down there is you know you get all these uh, condos that become private and the current ownership won't upgrade the stamp up systems they don't want the the trouble the dust yeah. this that or whatever so this particular fire and correct somebody correct me if i'm wrong afterwards but it was, I think it was a six-inch main at a dead end that supplied this building. And there was fire on the, I don't know, fourth or fifth floor, whatever it was. And it started leapfrogging a little bit and, you know, started catching some, like, uh, plastic furniture on the upper floors up. And these guys went up there, and it was wind-driven. There was a good wind coming off this game bay that day. And it, it progressively got worse, worse, worse really quick. And if it wasn't for the guys and the... Uh, experience level on that engine company up there they would have gotten fried they were in our hose they were in combat ready an inch and three quarter which is a 188 um and they did not have nearly enough to take care of that wind driven fire so as a result of that fire and i'm not telling the whole story i mean there's more to it but sure. that's not my story to tell uh as a result of that fire bill was a huge proponent of upgrading their high-rise package to two inch they wanted more water. They wanted more GPM. A lot of it had to do with wind driven, and uh, they went ahead and launched this project. Bill and you know his bosses launched this project and uh, switched everything over to two inch for all their high rise packs. So they did that, and they, they actually the funny thing is is you know not too long after that we introduced two and a quarter, true ID, which uh, I don't know if anybody watching this would know, but uh, H Rock. Uh, Kurt Isaacson does that whole high-rise conference in Pensacola every December. Mm-hmm. It's uh, probably the one place you can go in this country and, and learn more than anywhere else, anywhere else. Uh, those guys that he has coming down there are just phenomenal. I mean, they, the best of the best from all over the country. 
Dave McGrail. I mean, all the high rise gurus, you know, Ray, Dave, and the list goes on. And Bill, I mean, the list is on and on. But anyway, so the first year we introduced the two and a quarter, it's cold as shit. There's like a 50 mile an hour headwind coming off the beach in the alley between the two hotels. There's like four or 500 students inside listening to. I don't remember who was lecturing. And the other 40 or 50 instructors were all out in the alley. And Bill says, let's lay down this two-inch shit and let's lay down this two-and-a-quarter-inch shit and see which one's better. This is after Miami Day just spent an ungodly amount of money <laughs> on two-inch combat going. ready. Yeah. <laughs> so we laid them both down. And Bill's like, well, yep, blah, 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 blah. And, and with the two-and-a-quarter. And Kurt Isaacson, the one that, you know, that does the whole ATROC thing down there, and of course, he's he's just a great guy too. He came out in a three piece suit, and he has this two and a quarter in his hand. He's flowing it into this headwind, getting soaking wet, and everybody's flowing this shit. So the, the the moral of this story is, you know, things always change. Okay, they did what they did, and Bill pulled me off to the side behind a dumpster and gave me a little shot in the ribs. He says, "Fuck you. We just spent all this money on the two inch, and then you bring this shit here." Huh? <laughs> Fuck you. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's options. I, I just all I like that story. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's always changing. There's always changing. But no, there's you know, back to my point. You know, I get sidetracked. But wind driven, wind driven's for real. And that's what a lot of you know, a lot of departments along the coast just don't get. And if they don't get, hopefully they're they're proactive instead of reactive. Because wind driven usually ends badly if they're not prepared so sure there you go you asked for a story you got one i did thank you <laughs> yeah i always like a good story time well, story time with dave story, story time, time with dave this yeah. needs to become a weekly thing yeah we need to burn a house agreed we need to, we need to get the live burn <sighs> thing back going you know we got to get COVID out of here i still have that gear from southeastern from mm -hmm. stephanie I told Hook, I said, we need to give that shit back to her. I'm never putting this shit on again. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I ain't, yeah. I ain't what, doing it. What kind anymore. of gear is it? It's the uh, lion. Ah, the lion stuff. Yeah. The yeah. new yeah. shit. Whatever yeah. the last shit they bought, yeah. I got a set of that. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I'll give you this. I'll do, if you if you tell who, you tell whoever, set it up. I'll do one more with y'all. That's all yeah, we, we ask. Yeah, we never got it. And I get to pick bang. my crew. All right. Hmm. Sure. I wonder who that's going to be because <laughs> I ain't lifting pallets. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't fucking doing this. I ain't fucking doing this. <laughs> but I'll do one. I promise you, I'll do one more. All right. That's it. We'll get one more out of you. One more. I'll report back to everybody uh, who uh, the you crew can, was. Yeah, make sure you yell at them on the scene, not back in the sitting room. I can't believe you're so surprised by that, to be honest with you. What? <laughs> that you are going to no, burn one you, more? No, well, that too. Yeah. No, I, but you, man, I, you don't ever take nothing back to the sanctuary. Yeah. You take, I, you take care of it on the Ponderosa. Yeah. It makes sense. Uh, it's true, man. W we see a hot wash at my fire my firehouse. Uh, uh, that hot wash at the end where we identify what we did wrong first and then what we did right, it uh, it never felt like a super negative thing. Of, we like learning. So point out something that, that I did wrong or, or we shared it. So it was a... It wasn't that but heavy. you know what I meant by that? I, I totally get it, and it makes perfect sense to me. I'm going to change. I'm gonna... Don't shit where you eat. Yeah. There's a scenario for you. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a good thing. Or yeah. they might shit where you eat. Right. <laughs> yeah. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Especially as a boss. You always yeah. got to remember that. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I like nah, it. That's just something I threw out there, man. Yeah. Take it or leave it. So. Yeah. Value. Wisdom. Yeah, just... Things I've picked up on and learned from people before me. Yeah. That's why I threw those names out there that I learned. That's one of the things I learned from them. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being willing to share. Hey, man. Yeah. Love you guys. Yeah. Oh, I Love know you too. guys. Yeah. Yeah, this is fun. Yeah. Well, we've uh, we've had fun in the past, and this is just sitting around bullshitting now. Yeah. It's some, like being back in the sitting room. Yeah. Know? Some of my favorite conversations have been uh, after a live burn. At dinner. Yeah, most of the time in a Mexican restaurant. Yeah, the Mexican joint. Yep, most of you the know, time. You know, I asked you about that today because I was worried they. He said they slowed down a lot, Ooh. but they're still there. Good, good. Yeah, that place, man. Golly, how stinky do we go in there? Yeah, yeah, uh, real good. That was good food, man. It was. It was I don't even know if the food's that great. 
Well, Boy, we were so hungry. It all we matter. wanted was a few beers because we were all dehydrated matter. and shit. Right. So, yeah. yeah was, I don't know if the food's that great, but yeah, was, <laughs> it doesn't uh, matter. Well, Dave, I surely appreciate you coming, brother. You know, um, I appreciate coming down. Maybe we only get one more burn out of you, but I hope we get uh, I will promise you all one more. I hope we have many more of these make conversations. Make it right. Dave, we appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, I had yeah. fun with you all. This has been fun, man. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, yeah man. man. Thanks, Dave. And one more burn. One more. I promise, one more. All right. We appreciate you. I'm going to hold you to it. And then I'm turning my shit in. Thank you. Thank you all.